Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Introduction to Literature. This will be our final lecture on course content. Uh, this was always going to be the last sort of week where we would discuss actual works of literature. And then the original plan was to have you do presentations on your uh, final writing assignment, which is either one of two things, your uh, selection of a poem from the anthology that we didn't discuss or that wasn't assigned, and your explanation of it, your explanation of what it's all about, your introduction of it. Um, that's one choice for your writing assignment number three. Or the second choice is your writing of your own original poem of, uh, I think, 15 to 25 lines, I said, and your writing of a paragraph that explains your own choices. Uh, in uh, in composing this poem and how you were influenced by at least one poem from the course. And the directions, the revised directions for writing assignment number three are uh, under uh, the syllabus and other resources part of the Canvas site. Just click the link for writing assignment number three. You will find the assignment and you will also be able to submit it there because we were going to have in-class presentations and that obviously can't happen. And I didn't want to require people to make videos or something. I know that people have different levels of technological uh, ability and things like that. So I decided that what we would do instead of a class presentation is that I would simply make it a public assignment. So it will be posted publicly uh, when you submit it to Canvas. So be aware of that, especially if you're writing your own poem. Uh, don't write anything you wouldn't want your classmates to see. So that is writing assignment number three. That will be due April 30th. Um, and then I am going to also give you a final discussion board assignment this week. Uh, I'm just going to do one more. I want to give you all of next week to work on your own poem, uh, either the poem you're introducing or the poem you're writing. So there'll just be one more discussion board assignment for this week. I'm going to have you, I'm going to ask you to ask me any questions you have about the content of the course, about literature, fiction, drama, poetry, anything you never got to ask, anything you've been wondering, anything you want to know about the subject of literature, you will ask. Uh, and that'll just be worth three points, and that'll take us to 12, and that will end the discussion board assignment. So I will post that this week as well. And then what I will do, I'm not going to write a reply. Next week, I will do a final video, kind of a conclusion to the course, and the content of that video will be my answering your questions. I think that's how, like, since this class has become sort of a YouTube uh, channel or a podcast or something, I think that's how the YouTubers and podcasters do it with such Q&A. So that's what we'll do. We'll make that concession to this Internet medium. So that's it. Uh, I'm going to give a final uh, discussion of poetry today, treating the uh, terms and ideas you were introduced to in the last two sections of the textbook I assigned. And then, as usual, I went outside of those chapters to the Reading More Poetry section and found two poems that I thought were very famous, very uh, much discussed when people discuss poetry. And I want to use those as examples for discussing the issues raised. And I also want to use those, particularly the last one, John Keats's Ode on a Grecian Urn, to actually bring our discussion of literature to a conclusion, to start to make some conclusions about literature and its its use. So that's what we'll do today. I don't know how long I will talk, hopefully not for more than an hour, hopefully even less, but we'll see. Uh, so let me just get started. So I put, as I sometimes do, a little selection from Kelly J. Mays's introductory uh, materials onto the first slide. It's where she's discussing symbolism. And she says, Properly used, the term symbol suggests one of the most basic things about poems, their ability to get beyond what words signify and to make larger claims about meanings in the verbal world. All words go beyond themselves. They are not simply a collection of sounds. They signify something beyond their sounds. Often things 
uh, or actions or ideas. Words describe not only a verbal universe, but also a world in which actions occur, acts have implications, and events have meaning. Sometimes words signify something beyond themselves, say rock or tree or cloud, and symbolize something as well, such as solidity or life or dreams. Words can, when their implications are agreed on by tradition, convention, or habit, stand for things beyond their most immediate meanings or significations and become symbols, and even simple words that have accumulated no special power from previous use may be given special significance in special circumstances in poetry as in life itself. A symbol is, put simply, something that stands for something else. So I want to elaborate on that a little as we go. But first, uh, this was from the little chapter on symbolism, but there was a chapter on visual imagery that I thought was important uh, because a mistake, I think, well, I don't know, this is probably too broad, but it would be a mistake, I think, for a poet to want to create a symbol, uh, want to create something in the text that stood for something beyond itself that was more abstract. So let's go back to Kelly J. Mays' example. Let's say a rock stands for solidity. A rock might be a symbol for something solid or rigid. So solid and rigid are abstract ideas. That is to say, they are concepts we have of a state of being, but where did we get those concepts? Well, probably from our experience of particular things that were solid or rigid that we encountered in our lives through our senses. So the rock came first. You know, we touched a rock, we handled a rock, and that gave us our idea of solidity. Uh, I mean, that's what, that I'm making that claim. Other people would disagree. Plato would disagree, but who cares what Plato says? We handled a rock, we touched a rock, and we devised our, our idea of solidity. So if a poet wants to evoke solidity, the poet would be well advised to not just talk about the concept because the concept is just in the mind, but the rock is something you've touched, you've handled, you've felt, you've felt the weight, you've seen various rocks, you've seen how different they could be. So poets, and this is equally true, I think, of fiction writers or or dramatists who could use symbolism as well, what they generally want to do is give you the rock in all its particularity in their work, and then you can begin to think about its more abstract meaning. Remember when we did the fiction unit, we talked about symbolism in reference to A.S. Byatt's The Thing in the Forest, that story which you all wrote your papers on. Um, And you remember that The Thing was obviously, I think it's obvious because you all wrote papers saying this, that it, it was obviously a symbol for trauma, for the war, and yet how vividly, it was an almost two-page description by it gave of the thing in its particularity. Well, similarly, a poet will want to do the same with uh, symbolism. The poet will want to give you the thing in all its concreteness, in all its particularity, in all its granularity, in all its appeal to the senses. Uh, And if we privilege sight, it's probably because Um, Our culture just tends to privilege sight above the other senses, but imagery can be an appeal to all senses. It will want to give you that image before it makes you think of the concrete abstraction. And how does it do so? Well, that chapter gave a few terms. This is just a review. We've seen all these terms before, but I think where they apply here is that the idea of these literary devices being used to appeal to the senses. So the first idea, and I don't think Kelly J. Mays actually uses this term, but I'm going to use this term, is description. The use of particular concrete terms to create a visual image. Descriptive poetry or descriptive prose is particular and detailed. It won't just say that something is green. It will give you a very specific term for a certain shade of green. Um, I can't think of an example just now. Oh, okay, it will say, you know, it it um, it was uh, it was jade, you know, something like that. Something that gives you a specific green. Something that gives you a specific color reference or 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 other kind of visual reference. So that's description. 
And by description, I mean without the use of figurative language, just kind of telling you what something looks like. I guess jade is a bad example because jade is a rock. So if you're comparing a mineral or what, I don't do science, but jade is something. So if you say that the colors of a, the leaves of a plant are jade, you've then implicitly compared it to the rock. So that's a metaphor. Um, I, I, it doesn't matter. Um, Let's go into figurative language. It's hard not to use figurative language to describe something because all you can ever do often is describe something unfamiliar in terms of something familiar. And that's what figurative language is. It's a use of language that turns away from a literal meaning to create an image. So literally something is just green, but what kind of green is it? Well, I have to compare it to something else that you already know to tell you. It was the color of jade. Um, so is jade even green? Uh, I should prepare for these lectures, but I, I would have prepared for them by learning something about science. But anyway, jade, I'm assuming jade is green here. You can, you can look it up. So what are these types of comparisons or associations? Well, the first is simile. A simile is an explicit comparison between two unlike things where you're comparing generally one that's familiar to the reader in terms of one that's not, uh, using like or as. So the, the leaves of the plant were as green as jade. A metaphor is an implicit comparison between two unlike things, and it's implicit because you don't use words signaling the comparison. So a simile is very explicit. The plant is like jade. A metaphor is implicit. You are implying the comparison, as if I said the jade leaves of the plant, okay? Either way, you, you want the reader to think of something unfamiliar in terms of something familiar, in terms of something they already know about. And that helps to create an image. So uh, there's that. Then we have, uh, hold on, I'm looking up jade on my phone. Didn't we do this last week with some other rock? Yes, jade is an ornamental mineral, mostly known for its green variety. See, I was right. We're good. All right. Next, we have a similar pair. So simile and metaphor are a pair. They're a comparison between two unlike things. One is explicit, using like or as. One is implicit, not signaling overtly. Metonymy and synecdoche are likewise a pair. A synecdoche, um, a, a metonymy describes something by using an associated word. So it's not a comparison, it's an association. And there was a really good example in your book, because um, it's a very common phrase we use, is to say that somebody got married. We say they walked down the aisle. And why does that, why do we associate that with marriage? Aisle is a very general word. Any building might have an aisle in it. But generally a church has an aisle. And the bride and groom process down that aisle to the front of the church to get married. And because that's a tradition, because that's a custom, because we're so used to that idea, we say walk down the aisle to mean get married because we associate the aisle of a church with marriage. So that's a metonymy. A synecdoche is a similar idea. It's when you describe the whole of something by naming the part. And I've often found these two things hard to uh, distinguish between metonymy and synecdoche because let's get back to the example, walk down the aisle. While the aisle is part of the church, which is part of the whole idea of the marriage ceremony. So I feel like the walk down the aisle is as much a synecdoche as it is a metonymy. Uh, another example of a synecdoche would be uh, to say... Um, what's an example that's clearly not a metonymy? They took up arms for they went to war. Now, you know, taking up arms, that is weapons, is just one part of the whole process of going to war, but it evokes the whole. Similarly, arms um, 
are related to war. So it's a metonymy as well. I actually think all synecdoches are metonymies, but not all metonymies are synecdoches. But we don't need to get that involved in such a, uh, in such a narrow topic. Let's just move on. Next, we have personification. A personification is, I would say, a type of metaphor, really. It's where you describe something abstract or inhuman as if it were a person. Uh, and we saw that in, that was a, something we uh, saw in T.S. Eliot's love song of J. Alfred Prufrock with the fog that rubs its back along the window panes as if it were, at least as if it were alive. Maybe it's more like an animal. But we're describing something not alive, the fog, as if it were alive. You could also say um, uh, the wind, the wind tore the branches from the trees as if it had, you know, arms and hands and could tear things. So personification, you get the idea. And we're going to see that later in the Ode on a Grecian Urn. And then finally, an allusion is a reference to something outside the poem. And that could be anything. It could be a prior literary work. It could be a historical event, a scientific fact, a religious concept, a mythological concept. Uh, I think we read that poem in your uh, anthology called Eugene Blankenships by David Bottoms, or Blankenship by David Bottoms, or Blankenships by David Bottom. I don't have the book in front of me, and I'd never read that poem before. But you'll remember it was a description of his grandfather's friend. His grandfather was like a grocer, and this guy would come in and buy stuff on credit. So it was this poignant description of this, you know, this man. And one of the ways the poem worked to create that sense that it was taking uh, taking place in the past is it used brand names of products from whatever 50 or 100 years ago that's an illusion if you're aware of those then you will sort of uh, find the poem a credible recreation of that past so that's just the way that these are just some of the ways that a poem can create an image and creating an image is related to creating a symbol because the symbol will not be interesting if it doesn't concretely appear as an image in the poem. So let's think about that. What is a symbol then? So Kelly J. Mays already told us a symbol is something that stands for something else. It's, it's, a, it's a feature of the text of the poem or the story, or the play. This symbolism is all through any type of literature that it, that that gestures to some larger meaning beyond what it just represents. Think, in fact, of Antigone, which we read the play Antigone. The characters were arguably symbolic, as you said. You you discussed it brilliantly on Canvas. You said that Antigone, as a character, stands for the qualities and the attributes of loyalty to family and tradition, whereas Creon stands for the attributes of loyalty to law and the state. They are arguably symbolic characters. Well, the same thing happens in a poem. You will be presented with an image of something, and that something will hint to you in various ways that it means something beyond itself, that you're supposed to uh, attribute some universal conception to this image. Uh, and then Kelly J. Mays distinguishes between two types of symbol. I think in practice, and I think she says this too, in practice they're not always easy to distinguish, but one of them is the invented symbol. The invented symbol is a symbol whose unique meaning in a given poem is created by the poet. So it's not, there's nothing you can consult sort of outside the poem to tell you what it means, it means something particular to the poem that the poet will clue you into. And often, actually, the way this works in real life is you can't just read one poem by a poet to determine what their invented symbols mean. You have to read a bunch of them. And they mention this, they, should, they use the poem The Sick Rose by William Blake. William Blake's you, you can never just read one poem by William Blake because he created his own mythology. Everything in one individual poem sort of has to be interpreted with reference to his whole 
understanding of the world and the symbols he made up to signify that understanding. So the sick rose in general, um, uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to explain it. But the point is, you can't just have a general idea of what a rose means. It meant something very particular to him. And then, you know, the invisible worm that flies in night. That's all unique to Blake's system of symbols. Uh, a more comprehensible ex uh, example, I think, would be Adrian Rich's poem, Diving into the Wreck, which was also in this chapter. And again, it helps to have read more Adrian Rich, but if you just, even if you just read that poem, and the whole process of diving into the wreck and the wreck, they're all described very vividly. It's a very concrete image in the poem. But for her, and she was, I'll just tell you briefly, she was a feminist and a radical poet uh, of the 1960s and 70s when that poem was written. And for her, diving into the wreck means exploring the oppressions and traumas, particularly for women and other marginalized people, of history. So the wreck is the catastrophe that history has been for women and other marginalized groups, and she wants to dive into it to examine, to explore what that history was. So the wreck is her symbol for that. She invented that symbol. A wreck, you know, shows up in other poems, but it it mean it doesn't mean what it means for her. On the other hand, there's a traditional symbol, a symbol whose meaning is already agreed upon and has a long history. Now, a, a rose is actually a good example. A rose occurs throughout uh, literature and poetry as an example of romantic love. And I think Blake, in part, means to evoke that as well. That poem has something to do this worm invades this rose, okay? That poem has something to do with some kind of sexual experience. But for him, he's not using it in that traditional way. Traditionally, it's a positive symbol of love and romance. He has reinvented it as something else. And that's why, why I say that there's not a clear distinction between the traditional and the invented symbol. Most things, you know, at this late date in history have had a meaning attributed to them in any given culture. And then a poet comes along in that culture and uses that thing, but the poet won't be very interesting if the poet simply just goes with the traditional meaning. The poet usually re-describes that thing in terms of some other meaning. So that's just some ways of thinking about symbolism in poetry. I, I, I tend to go toward the view that all literature is symbolic in some sense, that most writers, whether of fiction, drama, or poetry, are not just telling you about some thing that happened that they made up that's just some private, you know, reference. It's They're telling you about something they made up in its particularity to tell you about something more general about your own life or about our own collective experience. So I think, uh, I thought symbol was a fitting note to end A Course in Literature on in the sense that all literature is symbolic. All literature tells its story to tell a more general story about ourselves. And I thought we would end with two poems. We would end both our unit on poetry and both the course itself with two poems that have two very different uses of symbolism. And I thought it would be interesting to compare them. I've put them out of chronological order. We have a 20th century poem, Yeats's The Second Coming, and we have a 19th century poem, Keats's uh, Ode on a Grecian Urn. I know their names are spelled the same, but they're pronounced differently, so it's Yeats and Keats. And I also, I'll confess to you, when I made the syllabus, my idea was to have Yeats's poem as the example of the wrong way <laughs> to use use symbolism to write a poem, and Keats's example was the right way. Now you might, I told you, I told you back when we had in-person classes, and I was criticizing Water by the Spoonful. I said I'm not just doing this because it's a contemporary writer. I will criticize the classics as well. And so yes, William Butler Yeats is a great poet. William Butler Yeats won the Nobel Prize for Literature. He's generally considered one of the 20th century's greatest poets, and I agree with that. I admire his poetry. And yet, uh, I think this poem that I want to look at, The Second Coming, there's Yeats, 
Uh, if you look at the screen there, uh, that's him off to the side. I mean, he he's the only person pictured. Um, I admire him. And yet I feel that this poem uses symbolism in a way that I don't necessarily appreciate or think is less interesting than the way Keats uses symbolism in the Ode on a Grecian Urn. So, but however, that's probably, I probably shouldn't be so uh, preachy. Let's just read the poems and see what we think and let my opinion recede into the background. So this is W.B. Yeats, William Butler Yeats, The Second Coming. It's probably... I would I would I would have to guess the most quoted poem of the 20th century. As I I'm going to read through it with you and you'll hear phrases that you hear all the time when people are talking about culture or politics. Uh it's it's a very quoted poem, but it's also a very strange poem and it's hard to know what it's about. So let I'm just going to read it once and then I want to tell you some things about it and then we'll come back to it and read it again and see what we think. So the second coming, turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in the sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, is moving its slow thighs, while all about it reel shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that twenty centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. All right, so I'm sure you've heard some of that before. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Um, uh, what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. But what a strange poem. What does it mean exactly? What does it mean? And as you can see, just by looking of the at the picture I took of the poem in your textbook, there's a bunch of footnotes. There's a bunch of footnotes. And the first thing you have to do to understand the poem is read the footnotes. So I've taken a picture of those. Let's just read them. So the title refers to a concept from Christianity that um, Jesus died and came back and then ascended into heaven and then he would return to our world at uh, what was called the end of the age after a time of tribulation. And that would herald uh, the kind of the end of the human world. And that would be the last judgment. And God would finally sort of take everyone who goes to heaven to heaven and send everyone else to hell. And God would then reign and we would be sort of free of earthly life. Now, Yeats was not a Christian. Yeats was a, um, I don't know what the word is. Uh, well, Yeats was a magician. Uh, well, I mean, he was an occultist. He, uh, he, he wrote many of his poems under the dictation of his wife, who received messages from spirit. She was a spirit medium. You know, like in those movies, uh, Insidious and whatnot. Do you watch horror movies? I like horror movies. Uh, he would take dictation from his wife, who was a spirit medium. He believed, sort of, and then also had a certain skepticism that he was communing with occult forces. And he also developed his own sort of system of thinking about history. And he believed, unlike Christianity, so Christianity is linear. So at the end of the age, Jesus will come back and God will reign. Yeats believed that history was a cycle or at least a spiral. That's his word, gyre. 
Geyer is Yeats's term for a cycle of history. And so he said, when Jesus came the first time, Jesus ended the previous cycle of Greco-Roman civilization, which we explored in Antigone. Jesus comes and one cycle ends. And then Jesus starts a new cycle, 2,000 years of a Christian civilization. And Yeats believed that in the early 20th century, due to a whole variety of events like World War I, the Russian Revolution, things like that, the Christian cycle was coming to its end and a new cycle was born. And so the thing he sees in the desert is the god of the new cycle. And what he's seeing is a sphinx. He's seeing a, let's read it again, a shape with lion body and the head of a man. And if you know about ancient Egypt, you'll know that that is the great sphinx of Giza this giant monumental sculpture. And nobody really, I don't think, maybe I'm wrong, I'm not an Egyptologist, but I don't think anybody really knows what the Sphinx represented to the Egyptians or what the purpose of this monument was. I even think that there's some controversy over when exactly it was created. Um, but Yeats uses this as his symbol for the next cycle of history. And it's very different from Jesus. Jesus uh, is characterized <clears throat> in Christianity as a compassionate figure. You know, let the little children come to me. He's often depicted in Christian images as having the, the, the this sacred heart. He's this compassionate figure. He takes our sufferings upon himself. This is a very different figure, what Yeats sees. He uh, this the Sphinx has a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun. And it's surrounded by indignant, which is to say angry, desert birds. It's a rough beast. So the next cycle will not be characterized by Christian compassion. It will be characterized, as Yeats says in footnote six here, as laughing ecstatic destruction. And you see my, my citation in the bottom right of the slide is what Sphinx meant to Yeats from a Yeats dictionary. So that's the kind of poet Yeats is. You need a special dictionary of just what things mean to him to understand any of his poems. Blake was like that too, and Yeats was inspired by Blake. So it's not he's not in that sense always an open-ended poet. His symbols are in some ways private, in some ways occult. They're always elusive. Now, he did believe that, he believed in this idea of spiritus mundi, the world spirit, that we kind of all have these images in our heads. There's this kind of what the uh, his contemporary, the psychologist Carl Jung would call the collective unconscious, that we all have the sphinx in our heads, we have Jesus in our heads, and he just has to sort of activate them in his poetry. But uh, you have to sort of study these things. You, you can't read this poem without the footnotes. You can hardly read it without the Yeats Dictionary. Now, he's such a good poet in terms of having a way with words that it almost doesn't matter that this poem becomes endlessly quoted. The first stanza brilliantly describes a world that's collapsing into anarchy, that's falling apart, uh, in terms that anyone can understand. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. That seems always to be true, actually. Um, and so he's, he's a good enough poet to evoke that, and yet his symbols have a predetermined quality. And I want to contrast that way of writing poetry with the much more open-ended uh, poem provided to us by John Keats in the Ode on a Grecian Urn almost a hundred years before. So Yeats's poem is from the early 19th century. It's from like 1819 or so. Uh, Yeats, so Keats's poem, early 19th century, 1819 or so. Yeats's poem is from 19... 19, and then he revised it and published it in 1921. So it's 100 years older, 
but I think it has a different attitude towards symbolism. Some things you need to know before I read the poem. Uh, it's an ode. That's a certain genre of poetry. An ode is a poem in which the speaker talks to or about some revered object. And a Grecian urn would be an ancient Greek vase that has some pictures on it. And finally, this is related to an ode, an apostrophe is a type of verbal gesture in a poem where a speaker addresses something dead, absent, or inhuman. So here's the situation of this poem. The speaker is standing in front of an ancient Greek urn or vase, and he's describing the pictures on it, but he's also addressing it. He's saying, thou, thou, you, urn, here's what's on you, and here's what it makes me think of. So that's the situation. Given that, what is this poem about? Let's read it once, just straight through, and then I will come up with some ideas. And I'll tell you why I thought it was an appropriate text to end a course on literature with. Thou still unravished bride of quietness, thou foster child of silence and slow time, sylvan historian who canst thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme, what leaf-fringed legend haunts about thy shape of deities or mortals or of both in Tempe or the dales of Arcady? What men or gods are these? What maidens loath? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore ye soft pipes play on, not to the sensual ear, but more endeared, pipe to the spirit ditties of no tone. Fair youth beneath the trees, thou canst not leave thy song, nor ever can those trees be bare. Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss, though winning near the goal. Yet do not grieve, she cannot fade, though thou hast not thy bliss. For ever wilt thou young, be, for ever wilt thou love, and she be fair. Ah, happy, happy boughs that cannot shed your leaves nor ever bid the spring adieu, and happy melodist unwearied forever piping songs forever new. More happy love, more happy, happy love, forever warm and still to be enjoyed, forever panting and forever young, uh, all breathing human passion far above that leaves a heart high sorrowful and cloyed, a burning forehead and a parching tongue. Who are these coming to the sacrifice? To what green altar, O mysterious priest, leads thou that heifer lowing at the skies and all her silken flanks with garlands dressed? What little town by river or seashore or mountain built with peaceful citadel is emptied of its folk this pious morn? And little town, thy streets forevermore will silent be, and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can e'er return. O attic shape! Fair attitude, with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought, with forest branches and the trodden weed, thou, silent form, dost tease us out of thought, as doth eternity, cold pastoral. When old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man, to whom thou sayst, Beauty is truth, truth beauty. That is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know. So that's Keats, Ode on a Grecian Urn, often considered his masterpiece. There's our poet uh, Keats there. And what is this poem about? So I already mentioned the situation. The speaker is standing before a Greek vase, addressing it and describing the imagery on it. But what does it mean? Well, let's take it stanza by stanza. First, what does he call the urn? He calls it the bride, so he makes it a female figure of quietness, and the foster child of silence. I, and that I've never quite got that. What's the difference between quietness and silence? But in any case, this urn is related to 
silence. And that, why? Because it doesn't speak. There's no words on it. There's just images. However, and paradoxically, it's a historian. Sylvan historian means like sil- like of, of the of the woods. Why is it a historian? Because it is a historical artifact. And as a historical artifact, it tells us about history. And so then he be, so he says it's it's there's a there's again a paradox here. It's a mute object that nevertheless speaks about the history that it emerges from. He also notes, and this is a, this is a troubling aspect of this poem. He calls it a still unravished bride of quietness, and still means both not yet ravished and also eternally not ravished. Ravish, so literally he means virginal, that it's a bride, but the marriage has not yet been consummated. But ravish has a a connotation of sexual coercion, of rape. And this image will recur later in the poem when he talks about the imagery on the urn. One of the images specifically is a young man chasing a young woman. And on the one hand, this speaker seems to interpret this as playful, flirtatious. And on the other hand, he seems to interpret it as a genuine chase. And so at the end of this stanza, he says, what maidens loathe. That means maidens who are not happy with the situation. What mad pursuit, what struggle to escape. So he's looking at the urn, he's looking at the picture, and he's saying, what is this? What is this? What does it mean? He says in the second stanza that, it's better to actually look at this urn and to experience its silence than to hear any actual music because the silence of the urn speaks to the spirit. And so what does, what does it say to him when it speaks to his spirit? Well, he, it says a couple different things. It says, here's this image of a fair youth, a bold lover pursuing this woman. And first of all, we have the complication I already pointed out. Is this a playful flirtation or is this a very troubling, very upsetting chase? And then the second problem is that the image on the urn is suspended. It's frozen. It's just one image. So he says, there's a good thing about this, which is that you will never get old. You will never die. She cannot fade. You will forever be in love. And yet the bad thing is, well, you're, 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 you're always alive, but you're also dead because you're suspended in one instant of time that can't progress. So this is a paradox of the urn. It's a frozen image. And as frozen, it's immortal, but as frozen, it's dead. He returns to this theme in stanza three. He says it's a great, uh, he says, you know, there's a picture on the urn of a piper, someone playing a pipe. And he says, you're forever playing that pipe. And that's beautiful because the songs will always be new. And yet the problem is all breathing human passion is far above the urn. That is, I, the speaker, who am human, passionate and breathing, am alive but this object, which is immortal, is dead. And so I will die, but it will never die. But I can live, and it can never live. Do you see how complicated this is? It's extraordinary. Then he looks at another part of the urn, and he sees a priest and a town processing in a ritual, and they're going to ritually sacrifice a calf, a, or a heifer. I would argue that this is related to the imagery of the uh, chase before, of the man chasing the woman, that the pictures on this urn superficially sound like they might be sort of pastoral, to use that word, like the, the beauties of what happens out in nature, but there's a very disturbing element to them. There's this chase that sounds like a, an actual assault. There's this religious procession that has as its heart this sacrifice. And the people who have come on the religious procession have left their town empty and desolate, a word that has a very negative 
connotation. So the urn is good, it's, it's beautiful, it's pastoral, and it's immortal, but it's bad. It depicts ugly, disturbing, oppressive things, and it fixes them forever so that no progress is possible. What conclusion can we come to about this? Well, he, can, he, he boils it down, first he boils it down to two words, cold pastoral. It's a pastoral, it's about the beauty of nature, but it's cold because it's dead, because it's frozen, because it can't progress. It's also cold comfort, the images on it, the history it relates of sacrifice and of assault, if you read it that way, are disturbing. Then he comes to another conclusion, the speaker. He says, beauty is truth, truth, beauty. And this is a line that critics and scholars have argued over for since this poem was written for two centuries, for over for 201 years. They've argued about what this means because beauty is truth and truth beauty is a bit paradoxical. We tend to separate these things. We tend to think that, you know, we, 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 we even say the ugly truth. Truth is actually ugly. Truth is death and illness and uh, and violence. And beauty is something else. Beauty is something over there that is all those things that truth is not. Beauty is often associated with illusion, with deception, with, um, with art. And Keats, the speaker, I think, says about the urn that the only way to appreciate it is to take its ugly truths as beauty. Um, not, I think one way of reading this that would be very wrong and very superficial is to say everything on the urn is very beautiful and therefore this is the truth of life. But no, that's not what's on, that's not, you know, you reread the poem. That's not what's on the urn. The stuff that's on the urn is not superficially beautiful. It's when you just think about it for two seconds, a little bit ugly. It's sacrifice and it's assault. And so then the question becomes, what is the value of this object, this urn, if what it's preserved forever is some ugliness. I think he, the implicit argument of the poem is that to appreciate this work of art, you have to let it speak to you of what the reality of history is and let it provoke you to thought. Let it tease you out of thought. Let it bring thoughts to your mind. And therefore, I would argue that the urn is a symbol of art or literature as such. What it depicts is often not beautiful. What it depicts is often histories that we don't want to think about or don't want to remember or aspects of our psychologies and of our lives that we'd rather not think about. And it immortalizes those. And the reason it immortalizes those is because they are reality and it captures reality in its beautiful imagery. And we have to think about that and we have to face that and we have to reflect on that. And that's the purpose of art and literature, according to Keats, according to the Ode on a Grecian Urn, and perhaps, just perhaps, uh, according to the Course, as I have given it to you over these strange and tumultuous many weeks. So uh, I thank you for that. That's the end of my lecture. I will see you on Canvas, where I will again invite you to ask a question of me about literature. And I will, don't wait for my reply on Canvas. I'm not going to type a reply. I will make a video replying to you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you found it illuminating in some way. Uh, and I hope you have a great week. Thank you.